Hey everybody, welcome to Tone Benders, where we talk with the sonic artists behind our favorite films, games, and series. My name is Tim Muirhead, and I'm here with Teresa Morrow, my co-host. How are you doing today, Teresa? Hey, Tim. Good to be here. So today we're going to do something a little bit different. We're going to play you an interview for a film that is four years old, and there's a context behind this. <laughs> okay? So, uh, Teresa, do you want to talk to us a bit about how we first came to know Mark Jenkin? Yeah, so the interview is about the film Bait. Uh, the director is Mark Jenkin, a UK director. The feature film Bait was released in 2019. In the UK. In the UK. I would say this is a film that solidly falls in the experimental art film genre, but we heard about it through cinema review podcast that uh, we both listen to, which is the Simon Mayo, Mark Kermode film review podcast. Uh, that we've been huge fans of for decades. <laughs> so Mark Kermode, the critic on that podcast, gave Bait a uh, like absolute glowing, over-the-top review. In that review, he talked a bit about the really pretty intriguing and unusual technical processes that went into making that film, which piqued both you and my interest in possibly talking to Mark Jenkin about the process of sound on his film, which we're going to get into in the interview, is really quite out there. <laughs> it's pretty amazing. When we say it's an experimental film, it is a narrative film. It's shot black and white. It's shot on a Bolex. Uh, it's a beautiful film, but the sound process is completely unlike anything that I've ever uh, seen anyone attempt to do. So we're going to leave him to Mark to tell us about that. But we just wanted to let you know that he's got a new film out called Ennis Men. And in his promotional stuff for that, he's talked about how he went through the same process to make Ennis Men as he did with Bait. So we think that maybe this interview is still relevant. The reason the interview hasn't come out until now is we did the interview before COVID hit in 2020, but the film hadn't been given a wide release in North America yet, so we held on to the interview. COVID hit. It never got a wide release in North America, but we think it's a really strong interview. Uh, I think you'll get a lot out of it because it's someone talking about a process that will be very alien to most people that listen to this podcast. So we thought that now with this new film out that should cover some of the same uh, technical territory, we'd release this interview now because uh, we want the world to hear it because it's really interesting. So Bait, if you're in the UK, I think maybe you saw Bait in the theaters. It's also still available through BFI Player. If NS Men gets a North American release and does well, we'll see Bait streaming as well um, on some international services. Bait ended up winning a BAFTA award, so don't think that this movie is completely out there. It's definitely a different experience, but we, it's something that we think people should search out because it's definitely worth watching. So uh, maybe uh, without further ado, let's play this interview that we uh, recorded almost four years ago. <laughs> Here we go. Today we have something a little different for you. We have a director of a film called Bait. Now Bait is a film that has been released in Europe and when it came out, my Twitter feed for the Tonebenders kind of lit up with people saying, everybody's talking about how they did the picture for Bait, but how did they do the sound? And uh, I was like, what's Bait? I didn't know what it was yet. So I started doing some research and I saw the trailer and I was like, I need to see this film and I wanna talk to somebody that worked on it because this is a daunting task. So uh, today we have Mark Jenkins, the director of the film. But when I say director, that kind of almost doesn't cover it. You did almost everything for this film. Mark, how did you come up with the idea? Why did you decide to go down the road of shooting an entire film on Bolex, hand processing it yourself, and doing all the sound in post from scratch? Cut a long story short, um, probably 10 years ago, a bit less than 10 years ago, I was doing a lot of experimental film work. Where I was, where I've been shooting on Super 8 and 16 millimeter, and doing it all on my own, so post syncing sound because there's no way of really, really recording location sound with uh, certainly with Super 8 anymore. So I'd I'd established this new way of working formally through my short film work, which was shooting silently, post syncing everything, even sometimes adding a little bit of dialogue. At the same time, I was developing feature film projects with various producers and funders and commissioners and developing projects that were much more conventional in the way they were going to be made. But I was getting more and more success and more and more attention for my short film work that one day I just thought, how about I just apply this process that I've designed for myself that plays to all of my strengths and all of my passions. How about trying to take on one of these narrative screenplays in exactly the same way? And I did it 
did it with a, a mid-length film, 44-minute long film called Bronco's House a few years ago. We then decided to make bait uh, using, using the same process, which is shoot on a Bolex, no location sound, hand process the negative, cut the film, and then post-sync all the dialogue, do all the foley, do all the atmoses, everything in a studio environment afterwards. And that's, that's where we got to. Can you explain a little bit the story of the film? Um, yeah, it's about two brothers who are from a fishing community in the far west of Cornwall in the UK, so about as, about as far west as, as you can go in the UK, right out on the, on the tip of the land. And the, the older brother um, has inherited the family fishing boat from their dad, and uh, instead of carrying on commercially fishing, he's started taking holiday makers out on the boat, much to the uh, annoyance of the younger brother who wants to carry on commercial fishing. And so it's a, it's a war between the two brothers about the future of the fishing boat. But it's in a community that was once a fishing community, and some people still see it as a fishing community. Other people see it as a as a leisure place where people with a lot of money come on holiday and are repurposing it for, for leisure activities rather than industry. And it's just about tradition, about the old ways uh, colliding with the new ways or, subjectively speaking, the, the right ways clashing with the, the wrong ways. And it's also about the clash between um, working class culture and more um, affluent middle class culture within somewhere like the, the, the UK and what happens to... What happens to people when they feel alienated and disenfranchised and don't feel like they have a voice, how those frustrations and alienations manifest themselves? So I think it's it, it never intended to be, but it's turned out to be quite a topical topical film, um, especially in the UK at this, in this present climate. Yeah, and I, I would say it, it has the feel of a thriller because it's a black and white film and it's a much older technology than we're used to seeing visually and also hearing. It evokes film of the past of all different kinds there's so many layers of associations that get triggered when you see and hear the first frames of your film yeah and i think you know nothing gets created in a vacuum so there are real overt influences in there but there are also influences that that become apparent because of the equipment that i'm using and because of the way that i'm working and i am in effect going back to using equipment and using limitations that were upon the the early filmmakers so inevitably uh people can point out parallels between my work and and sort of the earlier cinematic pioneers which is which is really nice <laughs> i don't know if people really understand how hand processing film works but the the emulsion of the film gets damaged basically by even the minor contact with the physical world so it's like it's full yeah, the screen it's full of scratches and and uh, all kinds of other things that you see have touched the film yeah yeah I, I think aesthetically it's very rough around the edges and it's in a lot of ways it's quite brutal again I don't know how intentional it was whether it was un, an unconscious thing but that's certainly um reflected in the content of the film as well which is quite a brutal story it's about a community that is rough around the edges so you, you, there is this sort of synergy between the form and content i th i don't think it comes across as a as a gimmick i mean it's not a gimmick to me because this is just the way i love working and i'm not doing it for effect it's just it's the process that i love the manual process of making a film but there is always a worry that people just call me a hipster and say mm -hmm. that I'm doing it for effect and fashion and all that kind of stuff. But in this instance, it really reflects the content of the film. Let's talk a bit about the actual process. For younger listeners of our podcast that weren't around in the uh, 80s and 90s, maybe they don't fully understand a Bolex and why you can't really record location sound with a Bolex because it's not a precise speed. Do you want to go into kind of your actual process a bit? I actually didn't pick a Bolex up until six or seven years ago. I, I, I knew what it was and I knew the esteem that it was held in, but also I, I felt it was a bit of a museum piece. But it was, yeah, about eight, seven or eight years ago, a friend of mine lent me their granddad's Bolex camera and as soon as I picked it up, I just suddenly thought, oh, yeah, this is why everybody's got such a close relationship with anybody who's used one knows what a beautiful piece of kit it is. I mean, one of the things is it's, it's a beautifully engineered piece of Swiss machinery that is so simple and so exact. But there's two things about it that mean that you have to shoot in a specific way when it comes to sound. One is that it's 
it's a noisy camera. It's not a blimped camera. So when it's running, you really know it's running. And I think it'd be the location sound recordist's nightmare to try and <laughs> shoot sound with it. Uh, and the other thing is the the frame rate. The standard version hasn't got a sort of crystal sync uh, unit on it or built into it or anything. It's It runs at a very rough frame rate. You set it to 24 frames, but depending on how old the camera is or how many times it's been wound or what point of the wind it's at or I'm sure humidity or temperature, all these other things really affect the actual exact speed it runs at. So it's quite idiosyncratic in that sense. And so the the temptation to record location sound is just completely removed, which paradoxically is incredibly freeing when it comes to the approach to shooting with it on location because you don't have to have any sound considerations, but also how creative you can then be in post-production sound because you're starting with a, a blank slate rather than having a lot of location sound that you might have to mend. Yeah, I think anybody who works day-to-day in film, the idea of not rolling sound maybe makes them feel a bit sick. <laughs> 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 like, what on earth are we going to do with this footage yeah. if we don't even have a reference point, especially if there's dialogue in it? Yeah, I think I'm the opposite. I think the idea, and you know, I'm not. I don't mean to do down the craft of the location sound recordist, which I think is probably the, the hardest job on a film set. Not not least because they they never really get listened to, and they're always the last consideration for people. It's all you know. You hear it all the time. People, a sound person saying, "Oh, can we wait a minute?" Because yeah, you know, there's an aeroplane going over the top, and we're shooting a period drama. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 we've got to go, we've got to go. We'll, you can fix that in post. Yeah. You're preaching to the choir here, buddy. <laughs> How dispiriting that must be. So my approach is just to cut that person out altogether. Um, and, I, and I think, you know, I, I work with very small budgets and I work, you know, I work with a lot of favours from people, not not least from people who are giving locations for free and things like that. So if I can go into a location and not have to worry about the sound considerations, I find that very freeing and I find that really exciting that I don't even have to think about that. So, for example, in Bait, there's scenes where it might be an exterior where you need to give the impression that there's nobody around. But we were filming on location around a harbour where there was a lot of people. So if we were recording location sound either, we'd have to record the sound in a way that we don't pick up any of that background sound, but obviously that has been budget considerations. At our level, we would probably just have a sound recordist with a microphone to pick up the dialogue, and all of that background sound would be picked up. Now, that's a a big fix. I don't even know how you would start doing that in post, other than removing all the sound and ADRing all the dialogue, which is kind of defeats the purpose of recording it in the first place. Yeah, well, that's the interesting thing. It's like... Um from somebody who hasn't seen the film to explain very clearly, you were shooting, you know, a dramatic narrative. You have characters talking to each other on screen. There, you call it ADR, but there, you're not replacing anything from <laughs> no. the set. Uh, there is really no sound recorded. So, yeah. Well, so yeah, maybe just to explain like how how you got the dialogue into the film. Well, it, the script is, uh, we, you know, we shoot the script very strictly there's no improvisation there's no there's no dialogue changes during the shoot and if there is then they're noted very carefully because obviously then I come in to do the edit and the first edit I do is with silent footage so through you through utilizing this process for the last couple of films I've done I'm a pretty good um lip reader now so I can I can edit based on lip reading what the characters are saying and I quite often I'll say their dialogue out loud as I'm editing over the top of their mouths moving in order to get the rhythms of scenes correct and then I recorded most of the dialogue myself so I voiced all the characters uh, in order to fine tune the edit then I get the actors in back in one by one none of the actors come into the studio together so they're all voiced individually so I can keep a real control over how they're um, voicing the dialogue and build the scenes bit by bit so yeah, the actors are coming back a long time after they've done the, the performance on location. But having said that, except for a couple of um, secondary characters who were voiced by other people because the actual actors weren't available, they're all revoicing their own dialogue. So it's actually, from my experience working with my cast, I think it's quite difficult to change the performance 
because people say things in the same way. We say very few words in our life and we say them over and over again each day and we say them in the same way because we have the same shaped mouths as you know the way people speak doesn't change in in a few months so actually when they came back in it was it's easy for me to say because I didn't have to do it but for the impression I got from them that it wasn't difficult for uh, technically for any of the actors to do it. That's an interesting point when we talk about ADR on our show and the post-sound world in general, and often a criticism is the reason they've called ADR is, oh, we want something different than yeah. what was delivered on set. And many people often comment, it's like, that's, it's very hard to sell that. Yeah. You can't do it. I don't think you can do it. I don't think, in my experience, there's a very fine parameter of change that you can work within but the, th- the thing that I've discovered is that the performance is really set visually when you shoot it it's done with the physicality and it's done more importantly with the eyes mm. and it kind of showed to me how you can try and change the performance and you can to a certain extent but you cannot change it significantly because the eyes never lie And the eyes have set the emotional intent of the words. You could change the dialogue completely, but then obviously it would look out of sync. But you you cannot really change the same words and give a different performance because the eyes will just betray it each time. I was wandering around on your Twitter feed and you posted some (laughs) pictures of uh, the process while you were doing the ADR and while you were doing audio posts. Can you tell us a bit about the analog room? I believe that's what you're calling it. Is that correct? Yeah, I mean, that's just a nickname that I, I had for the studio here. All the all the equipment in here is pretty much analogue. It's where I've got a turntable and my records and all that kind of stuff. And it's a bit of a refuge from the digital world. Um, so that's where that name came from. Um, it, it doubles up, really, as a, as a wet room for processing film. And one and a half, it's dry for doing sound work, really. And I've got a collection of old and new bits of analog equipment that I use. I tend to record everything to quarter-inch tape. Um, I run everything through a um, Tascam Porter Studio, and quite often I'll mix stuff down to cassette using that. Um, but also I'll just maybe run the sound through that to use the the very basic EQ controls that are on that. Um, yeah, I record to quarter-inch tape. I've got an old Ewer... Um, report monitor, little uh, portable quarter-inch tape machine that I've got when I was originally at college 20 years ago. That's what I learned to record audio with. I love quarter-inch tape. I love the tactility of it all. I love the functionality of the machine. So I use that a lot. And then I I use an analog compressor for dialogue recording. Uh, I use a modern microphone. And I, when I need to do voiceover uh, work or... ADR in inverted commas. I will. Yeah. I'll build a little um, voiceover booth in the back doorway of the studio. I like being able to do everything here. I mean, there's studios nearby that I could use, but I do like the flexibility of having my own space to use, and I do like building the environment to then get people into to do that kind of recording. So I do most of the foley, most of the all of the voice recording, and most of the foley. Um, here in the studio, a lot of the foley is replaced later on by by a proper foley artist. But I record that foley so I can use it in the edit to to get the rhythms of uh, of scenes working. So you, if you don't mind, I, I if I could grab a couple of the pictures from your Twitter feed of the voice booth, I think people would really like to see that. It's uh, kind of a metal frame that you've got sheets hanging down, and then the actors are in there shooting. Uh, and then there's other pictures of uh, the wall with just a million uh, strings of film hanging down. But then there's a picture of you mixing the film, uh, and it's at an all-digital desk with the, in a room. So you went digital for the final mix, eh? Yeah, I mean, the, the, edit, um, the edit is done, the picture edit is done digitally. I hand process all the negative and then Kodak scan it, and then I do the edit digitally at the end of the process it's it's reprinted back to 35 millimeter for, for as a distribution print but yeah a lot of the a lot of the intermediate work is done digitally so even though i'm recording onto tape i will then play that in to the digital offline edit 
and create a lot of the soundscape. Um, certainly the sort of positioning and, and rough mixing of the sound I'll do using Premiere. Um, what I then do is, uh, yeah, I go into a Pro Tools suite with my dubbing mixer, um, who, who is more than a dubbing mixer, really. He does some of the sound design towards the end of the process, and he also works with a Foley artist to replace quite a lot of my rough Foley. Yeah, it might be footsteps to go on a scene, which is supposed to be in the middle of the night in a deserted part of Cornwall and suddenly there'll be a toilet flush in the background which won't matter for the offline edit while I'm <laughs> working out the rhythms and everything of a scene but obviously he'll he'll then replace all of that in a much more controlled environment but yeah it's all the final mix is done in uh, in Pro Tools my take on what you're saying is that you don't see the process of making the film in this very manual style as a limitation but as something that frees you up I feel like that's also kind of mentality you need when you go and see this film is that you have to let go of a sense of how films should look, should sound, <laughs> yeah. and just kind of let it sink in. And, and the for me, the final effect of the film is like a day or two days later where you're still feeling the echoes of it a little bit. And to me, that like that's the mark of a good film, uh, regardless of what the themes are, or who the star of it was, or anything is are you thinking about it days later it really gets into your subconscious a little bit I think because it is so unfamiliar feeling yeah and I, I think um you know it's difficult I, I can never be an audience member for this film because obviously I'm, <laughs> I'm on the inside of it but but it is interesting to to hear people say that um because it mirrors how I feel, feel about my favorite films I'm very much of the the Bresson opinion that you should feel a film rather than understand it and I think if you do feel a film that the feeling stays with you longer and quite often if you're feeling a film the moment the moments after you've finished watching it you're you're not quite sure whether you even liked it or not I remember going to see one of my favourite films for the first time was a, a film called Radio On, which is a 1980 British road movie, if there can be such a thing, <laughs> by Chris Pettit. And I saw it at a little independent cinema in Bristol called The Cube. It hadn't been screened for a long time. film wasn't available on DVD or anything like that. And I, I went to watch it, and as the credits rolled at the end, I just sat there thinking, I'd, what was that? And I heard somebody further down the, the row just say out loud that was the shittest film I've ever seen. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, thought, I thought, yeah, they may be right, but they also might be very wrong because it might be the greatest film that I've ever seen. And it just stayed with me. The atmosphere stayed with me. Not the plot. I wasn't thinking about the story. Just this sense of something following me around was there. And, and it's, been, it's gone on to be a film that I watched over and over again because I feel it more than I understand it. And I had the same recently. I was lucky enough to see a festival screening at the London Film Festival of Robert Eggers' new film, The Lighthouse. Ah, yes. Um, and then a day later, I had I went over to Belgium for a screening and it was playing at the festival over there and I, and I saw it again. So I saw it twice in 48 hours. And the first time I saw it, I thought, this is incredible. And, you know, the, the feeling I got from it was amazing. But I, I when I rang home to talk about it I said you know I'm not quite sure whether there's anything at the heart of it and then I saw it again in Belgium and it just had even more of an effect on me and I thought well does it matter if there's nothing at the heart of it the atmosphere and the sense of haunting that I had from it and I did and I thought actually no there is something at the heart of it and this is a real significant piece of work but it was definitely the feeling of it and you know because it's shot on film because it's black and white because it plays with traditional cinematic form obviously bait has been talked about in relationship to to the lighthouse it, by some critics and writers yeah. um but but i think that the, the um what the lighthouse did for me as a as a viewer which i think probably is what bait has done for other people has just just highlighted how amazing our sen suspension of disbelief can be mm. And so, and a lot of people, friends of mine who've watched Bait, who've come along to screenings, have said to me at the end that, yeah, they really love the film, but they spent the first five or ten minutes thinking, how am I going to tell Mark politely that I didn't like this film? <laughs> because they were trying to um, adapt yeah. to these conventions that they weren't used to. But then suddenly, at some point, and they don't notice it happen, and this is what happened with me with The Lighthouse, and this is how I can sort of talk about it, um, is that 
at some moment your suspension of disbelief kicks in and and the, the human suspension of disbelief is just such an amazing thing and I don't know whether it shows I don't know whether it highlights how stupid we are or how sophisticated <laughs> we are that we can look at black and white post-synced images chucked at a wall edited together in a chronology that doesn't make sense but somehow kind of get involved in that and think wow you know get engrossed in it and invest in the characters and go on feeling emotions about it long after you've seen it i mean does that are we just really dumb or are we just really clever i don't know <laughs> yeah, yeah. put your finger on it I think. I think something that you did in bait that kind of is a good trick to give you that kind of feeling is your use of radio in the background things being spoken about the radio when they're in the kitchen you know uh, getting ready for the day or whatever and there's just talk yeah. radio going on and you can hear parts of it parts of it you can't hear and it's talking about some of the issues in a that maybe in a more abstract way the film is about did how did you go about scripting that radio stuff well it wasn't scripted i mean the, the, the thing is um as you'll know as as sound people that um if you don't record location sound if you want to then create a realistic soundscape, you have to add everything back in. It's no good just adding the dialogue back in because the dialogue just makes the silences around the dialogue even more deafeningly silent than they are already. So there has to be some sort of sound in the background. Um, that, the scene in the kitchen in the house, you know, I, 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 voice, I put the dialogue in and then just put a, a, a generic room atmos in um then there was a bit of sound from the harbor and the sound from the gulls outside but i didn't want that to be too noisy i didn't want this to feel like it was a it was an old fisherman's cottage that the that the wind and blew through and you could hear everything from outside i wanted the sense that they probably had double not double glazing put in but they had good windows put in um there was a sense they were a bit hermetically sealed from the actual location they were in so i I couldn't add all those atmoses in the background to fill the silence behind the dialogue and it, it needed something else and i thought yeah they'd have a radio on and in this in this country you know bbc radio they would probably be listening to radio four which is the type of radio, talk radio that would be playing and so um one of the producers of the film kate byers who works as a, a voiceover artist now so she can do a great bbc style radio voice so i just said to kate and this was probably hours before we had done we we're doing the final mix i said we just need something in the background of the kitchen and so i said can you just write a little radio piece go into the voiceover booth and record it and we'll drop it straight into the timeline. There was no real discussion about what it was going to be about, but in the UK at the moment, most most of the media is talking about Brexit all the time, so inevitably it became about Brexit. So Kate just went off and wrote this amazing piece. Um, Lynn uh, Waite, who's the other producer on the film, went in and uh, played the contributor on the on the radio programme, and they re- we recorded it straight onto the timeline, as it was. Now, I did shift it around a little bit because there was... Uh, there was a little bit that she'd written about um, imported chlorine-washed chicken coming over from the USA. And so by sliding that along the timeline a little bit, I could match up that audio with a shot of very fresh mackerel being handed over at the back door of the pub, which was a little bit of a provocative statement on my part. But then, <laughs> but then I didn't think about it again. But when we, when we went to Berlin, the German subtitlers subtitled the radio as well as the dialogue in the film so suddenly it became very prominent so i was sat in the theater at the world premiere seeing german subtitles over the brexit radio report thinking oh shit <laughs> <laughs> it looks like i've made a film about brexit which was never the intention so for the next four days we were we were in berlin at each q and a i kind of ended up being the unofficial spokesperson for Brexit from the British film industry, which was never my intention. You know, it, it, it wasn't something that I really thought about in terms of what was being said on the radio, and, I, and, I, and I'm glad, because it's, contri- it's not contrived, I don't think. It could, I think you can be very contrived um, getting across exposition in that way by making a sort of fake diegetic soundtrack that's actually telling the audience what's going on because there isn't enough sophistication in the way the characters have been developed to do that in a more subtle way. So I'm glad it's not, it's, it, you know, I, I don't think it's too, it's too contrived. And also it's not didactic, you know, it, it's, it's people 
it's it's supposed to be the BBC, so it was it was written very well by Kate to be a really an objective view over what was going on, so people can read whatever they want into it. Well, I thought it was used really effectively because there were points where you could hear it and points where you couldn't hear it, and it just kind of washed over in the background, and I, I thought it was a really nice touch. Great. Well, you, I mean, you know what it's like with that, that, that fine line between making something audible and inaudible. You sort of, it's tricky, You can sure. agon, agonise over it for ages, but in the end, it comes down to what sound system people are listening to things on and all that kind of stuff. So you sort of have to leave it in the lap of, go, lap of the gods to a certain extent. But The gods and the closed captioners. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, who are a law unto themselves. Uh-huh. <laughs> There's kind of a vibe going on. There isn't a traditional score to this film at all, but there are kind of drones and such. Well, funnily enough, I've just been doing, uh, I've just been writing about that because uh, the press release is just going out for the soundtrack album that's just about to go out. What happened was I, I started messing around in the studio with an analog synthesizer that I just bought. It's um, the a Korg Volca Keys, just one of those tiny tiny little ones yeah um i bought one of those just to have a play around with i i bought it when i just finished processing all of the the negative and i thought this will be good i can just start messing around with a synthesizer as a distraction from the film but i was so engrossed with the film that anything else i was doing i was ending up relating it back to the film so as i was making these drones uh, and they were playing in the studio. I was recording them to tape and then playing back and listening to them. And as I was listening to them, I was then going back and working on the film. So quite by accident, I was watching sequences of the film which were silent with the sound of these drones going over the top. And I just thought, actually, some of this works. There was never any intention to be any music in this film. Music in inverted commas. But <laughs> I started noticing that these drones started filling gaps in the soundtrack. And obviously, shooting silently, you do have a lot of gaps um, so there is, I'm, I'm always looking for something to put on the soundtrack that isn't the naturalistic sound. And I didn't want music. I didn't, it wasn't the type of film where I felt there was enough space for music to be doing much of the work. The montage needed to be doing, doing the, the work emotionally. Mm. But these drones started to work and they, and they felt quite embedded within the soundtrack straight away. So a lot of the soundtrack is the sound of the sea and these discordant drones were were working really well with the sound of the sea so i started i did a 20 minute drone called the gaps which i dropped little sections of into the edit and started playing around with the edit with these drones embedding them in the sound of the sea and the sound of the wind and all that kind of stuff and they just ended up staying in there they're not i'm not credited as the composer on the film there's no there's no mention of the the score at all in the end roller or in the titles or anything but um, Reg from Invader Records in Bristol, who released a huge amount of soundtrack albums, he happened to see the film in Bristol and got in contact and said, how do you fancy releasing the score as a, as a soundtrack album? And that's just about to happen now. So the score was created by accident, really. And, and I don't really know why it worked, but it did it sort of worked for me and I said to Kate and Lynn the producers I said you know I've laid in these drones uh, I'm only thinking they're temporary and uh and they got back to me and said no we really think they're working let's keep them in and I said yeah I think I think I I agree (laughs) but I needed them to say that rather than me sort of saying not only do I want to write it direct it shoot it edit it process it I also want to do the soundtrack as well (laughs) but luckily they they felt that that they were working well then it it was a a Q&A not that long ago that somebody pointed out that they sounded a bit like a discordant accordion, an instrument that's got strong maritime uh, connections. So it suddenly made sense to me. It's funny, in, in a film like this one, where there's like less elements at work, like you have more choice in your own mind of making sense of those things. Yeah, I think so. I think there's... I like films where there's room for the audience... So if there's if there's gaps, that's where the audience come in. And then the audience can really start projecting onto the film. And if cinema's supposed to be communication, then by definition communication is two-way. And so you need something from the audience. And in order for the audience to give something, there needs to be space for them. And it's what my friend of mine would uh, would term as uh, intuitive plausibility. <laughs> if you if you if you give the audience a few dots, they'll they'll join them up. Hmm. And you know they they might not draw the picture that you had in your mind but they will create something 
and that's that's a really involving way for the audience to to experience a film i think Teresa and I have a favorite uh, film reviewer that we've been listening to the radio show of for probably 20 years named Mark Kermode. And uh, after my Twitter feed lit up about uh, how did they do the sound on this film, Mark did a review of it. And Mark, a couple months ago, did a review of a film I worked on, and he savaged it. So I can't even imagine hearing them say, (laughs) coming up after the commercial break, we're going to review bait. Like, I would just die it, and then he comes out with a review of, as if it was the next coming of the Lord. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That, I mean, that review came out on the radio the day the film was released. So in the lead up to the release in the UK cinemas, I'd done two weeks of preview screening. So I'd been all over the country, which was great. But, you know, I'd been living out of a bag and staying in hotels and been away from the family and everything. And then I, I got to London and uh, Mary, my partner, who's also in the film, met me in London um, for the Friday night, we were going to an amazing London cinema, West End cinema, the, the Curzon Bloomsbury, which is a beautiful old cinema. And, and they were, I was doing a Q&A there for the first screening post-release of the film. So four o'clock, we were stood in the kitchen waiting for, to hear the review before we headed off to this screening. And review after review after review was being done and there was no sign of bait and the clock was counting down towards five o'clock and we were getting ready to leave and and then finally I think it was the last film or maybe the penultimate film and yeah this incredible review came out of the radio which was just um staggering really but I think him and uh and many other critics in the UK have, have really helped build the word of mouth about the film which is great, um, but also with regard to the box office, which is nothing, which is something I really never did consider that the box office would do well. You know, when I'm making a hand-processed 4-3 black and white post-sync <laughs> film about fishermen in Cornwall, you're not thinking, oh, this is going to be the next Lord of the Rings. But And it, and, it, and it's not. But relatively speaking, in terms of uh, what the expectations were, it, it's kind of gone through the roof. So, yeah, that was, that was, a, that was a big moment hearing... Um, Mark's review but to be honest and I don't mean this to sound arrogant because it I think it surprises me as much as anybody that the critically all the reviews have been have been very positive we've been very lucky I mean you know it, it, a lot of it's got to be down to the film I've got to accept you know that the film's <laughs> obviously resonated with critics and an audience but but I also do know that it's about timing because Sam before the subject matter seems to be resonating in in the UK which I suppose I thought it might. By the time we got round to the film coming out, I started noticing what 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 this film was was dealing with in a in a microcosm might be representative of what was happening nationally. Having travelled with the film, I've realised that it's what's happening in the world internationally. You know that there is uh, this gap between the the haves and the haves nots, the frustrations and alienation manifesting itself in in. In, uh, in destructive ways from, from people who feel they haven't got a voice. Well, I think that this film would have been uh, a tough sell, and I'm amazed at how the success you've achieved and uh, the critical acclaim, and uh, as you mentioned earlier, some box office success. Congratulations on making that work. It's a testament to the uh, artistic vision you had. Thank you. I think it's a credit to audiences. I think it happens once in a while that an unusual film, formerly unusual film, people agree to go see it. So I'm so glad that it was brought to our attention and glad you had a chance to talk to us about it because I hope people in our listening to our podcast are uh, be inspired to um, think differently about their processes. I think the audiences are incredible. I think the industry underestimates the the audience in the sense of what the risks that it's willing to take and I think people do want to get out and they want to see films in in cinemas and they also do want to be challenged if that's the right word I think the audience is a very multi-faceted sophisticated body that is that is underestimated a lot of the time you mentioned earlier about timing. I think there's also a real feeling of fatigue at the theaters right now where everything is a sequel or a reboot or uh, there is a yearning for something that's different, that's not you know, a massive superhero film. So you caught the right time and place and you filled that void and you did it successfully. So congratulations. Thank you. Thanks for coming on the show today. It was really great to have you. Looking forward to your next film. 
Thanks very much. It's a pleasure. Thank you very much for the invite. Film Bitters is produced by Timothy Muirhead, Renee Coronado, and Teresa Moro. Theme music is by Mark Strait. Send your emails to info at tonebenderspodcast.com. Follow us on Twitter via at the Tonebenders and join Tonebenders Podcast on Facebook. Support this podcast. You can use our links when you shop with Amazon or B&H or leave us a tip. Just go to tonebenderspodcast.com and click the support button. Thanks for listening. Are you looking for more audio related podcasts to listen to? Tonebenders is part of the Audio Podcast Alliance, featuring a hand-picked selection of the very best podcasts about sound. Be sure to hear the latest episodes from our friends in the community at audiopodcast.org.